So when I, I gave, uh, hopefully, if probably some people have been at my talk yesterday, and unfortunately for those people, I'm giving a roughly equivalent talk today. Um, however, at the last talk, I said, how many people in the room use Ember? And like three people raised their hand. If I ask you the question now, hopefully everyone will raise your hand. <laughs> okay, seems good. I see people with two hands. Awesome. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, how Ember makes it possible to build production applications fast. Um, and we've taught, we've, Ember has used the ter various terms to talk about uh, our applications we've used, ambitious application. Today I happen to be saying production grade applications. Um, but the basic point that I hope you'll take away from this and that you already know actually, but I'm really here to give you ammo for, to tell your friends how awesome it is to build applications in Ember, um, is that not only does Ember help you build applications quickly, but Ember, the applications that you build are the quality that you would need to put an application in production. So you can do a toy demo, and then that toy demo, if you put into production, is the kind of application that you would be happy and proud to put into production. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about my personal heroes. Um, not these guys, although I was looking for heroes on, on uh, Google Images, and this is what came up. So these are my heroes, but no. Um, my biggest heroes are people who stare into the face of cyni cynicism and pervasive pessimism and have the courage in those environments to still build awesome things. Um, this guy here is uh, Ezra Klein. He's the creator of Vox, V-O-X, not F-O-X. Um, Vox.com. Actually, he, uh, there's an AMA that he did, and the last question in the AMA is, do you ever, is it ever a problem for you guys that some people hear Vox and they think Fox? And his reply was, the struggle is real. So, <laughs> um, so uh, uh, he's trying to build a media company in a world where basically everyone thinks that the media uh, is dying, that there's no hope left. And he says, sometimes I just read this stuff and I'm just stunned by the pessimism in it. And I, I actually use this quote because this is sometimes how I feel about tech. Um, I feel like the current moment, not just in tech and not just in media, but in general, is kind of defined by a deep pessimism about our ability as a race, as a, as a human group, to do great things. Um, and I think what's really ironic about this is that the tools of the trade in basically all industries are finally cheap enough so that people who are passionate about something can actually make a go at doing something awesome. And so that's why Ezra says here, I'm super excited. I think other people should be a little more excited too. That's also how I feel actually about where we are today on the web. I feel like I get such a sense of uh, pessimism and cynicism about what we can do as a community of people on the web. And I I'm actually pretty excited about what we can do. Um, this is a quote from 1995 uh, at the height of Microsoft's dominance. Um, and so it comes right after the quote that you've probably heard where Steve Jobs says, uh, the problem with Microsoft is they have no taste. Um, and you, uh, probably everyone has heard that quote. And right after that, he says, their products have no sort of spirit of enlightenment about them. The sad part is that most customers don't have a lot of that spirit either, which is kind of a def the definition of the problem, right? If you're trying to build something really awesome, you have to contend with the fact that most of your customers are not going to understand what's awesome about the thing that you're building. But he says, so that's the problem. The solution is the way we're going to ratchet up our species is to take the best and to spread it around to everybody so that everybody grows up with better things and starts to understand the subtlety of those better things. Um, cynicism is a cheap and easy thing, but both human civilization and the history of programming is defined that by the idea that we could do more things together than we can do apart. Um, now, at, right after this quote, um, in, this, in, in a similar talk, uh, Steve Jobs says, I use this thing called improv and uh, another thing called Quantrix, which were competitors to Excel, and he says, if you used Excel or uh, improv or Quantrix for a week, you would think, how come everyone hasn't used this? How come if this hasn't completely replaced Excel? And he's just saying this sort of with a sad, wistful tone. And he says, there's no, there's no answers to this question except, let's go do it. Right? So Steve Jobs is saying, and I think this was true about 1995, is that there were all these things that were awesome, but Microsoft had such a big hold over the industry that people building awesome things felt like they were getting crushed. And Steve Jobs' response to that was not, Everything sucks, just give up, everyone go home. Steve Jobs' response was, I have no answers for why people aren't using this thing, but let's go do it. And I, I, what I would say is that, at least for me, I don't want to su surrender to the forces of cynicism and pessimism and darkness. I want to actually go do it. Um, I work on Ember and also, as a side point, on Rust because I think they're fundamentally empowering technologies. They let people do things that they couldn't do on their own. Um, and I think that's true about the best products and the best projects 
that they're enabling technologies. They enable people to do things that they couldn't do before. They give small teams the capabilities of bigger teams. So especially in the, in the 90s, this was true when Steve was talking, but it's also true today, right? There are things that you might think you need 100 engineers to do, and with some of the better projects and the better products, you can do these things with much smaller teams. Um, and they also give really talented teams the ability to do things that nobody could have done at all before, things that nobody uh, could have done with any set of technologies. And that's sort of, um, for me, that is the story of some of my best, of the best Ember apps, the Ember apps that I'm most proud of. So um, one example of this is uh, Ghost. Um, Hannah's talking about this later today. Ghost is a very small engineering team. It's, uh, it's seven people in total, and I think there's one person working on the Ember app. And Ghost is legitimately competitive with massive, massive blog platforms that probably people can perceive to be massively entrenched. And the fact that you could, you could make a, a company, start off as a Kickstarter, and you could build something with Ember and have it be competitive with a much, much bigger, uh, much bigger companies is very empowering. I think that's great. Um, I'm actually wearing their t-shirt by accident, Dollar Shave Club. Um, that you don't necessarily think of them as a technology company, but they also have a relatively small team working on an Ember app. Um, I was saying to Ed right before about Dollar Shave Club, it is actually the case, so I'm a customer, even though I didn't shave today. Um, I'm a customer of Dollar Shave Club, and it is actually the case that like, I get an email every month, and when I check in, I could like, add an extra thing of shaving cream, and it actually comes to my house. Um, and so there is some technology going on there that is important, and uh, the best technology companies pretty much hide the fact that there's technology going on. But the fact that you could do that with a relatively small team is pretty awesome. Um, Intercom, uh, which also there's a talk about later today, Intercom is, a, is a not such a small team anymore, but it started off as a, a pretty small team working on an Ember app. And this is also, right, it's a, a company that's competing with in a space that is dominated by massive players, and they're able to build a pretty awesome product with a relatively small team. Um, the Heroku dashboard started off as a, a very small team. It's still a pretty small team, um, people working on the Heroku dashboard directly. But I actually bring up the Heroku dashboard not to talk about Heroku, but instead to talk about another project called Canvas. So you probably haven't heard of it because it's not actually out yet. Um, but a couple of people from Heroku actually started a new company uh, called Canvas. And every time I hear that there's somebody who uses Ember, so Heroku Dashboard uses Ember, I, I say, well, they use Ember, but I can't really tell. They're not going to tell me if it sucks. They're not going to tell me I used Ember and actually I'm about to quit. It's terrible. I basically find that when they write the blog post, right? Um, but they uh, left with a couple, you know, they have three engineers, uh, like two engineers, and they decided to use Ember for Canvas after having success at Heroku Dashboard. And that also is pretty awesome, right? They started, they're, they're going to be competing in a pretty hard space, uh, like document management. I think in principle they're competing against like Google Docs, which has a massive team. And they, can, they feel like they could use Ember with a small team and be successful. Um, and finally, my own product, Skylight, uh, this is something we have, we also have basically no people. We're competing against, the companies we're competing against largely have hundreds of engineers, and we can build something that has, we think, a pretty nice UI, and uh, pretty, it's a pretty ambitious project. It's solving really hard problems. Um, and we use Ember, we use Rust, we use Kafka. We use a bunch of stuff that gives us high leverage. But really, the story of Skylight, like the story of a lot of these other projects, is that we couldn't have done this 10 years ago because 10 years ago we would have had to build it from scratch and that capital expenditure would have just required us to do it at a massive company. And the fact that we could do it at a small company is great. Um, and this is, this is true about a lot of people on the Ember Core team. It's a lot of people working on relatively small projects. And this doesn't even account for things like the successful uh, Skunkworks project at Yahoo that eventually became the UI for their entire ads platform, right? So even at big companies, when you're, you're inside of a company with a lot of capital expenditure, sometimes you're not actually able to convince people to give you the the money to do it. So being able at a, small co at a big company to take a small team and prove something out is also a pretty powerful thing to be able to do. Um, there's a lot, I've heard a lot of similar stories at other big companies. So really what Ember is all about is Ember is about increasing your personal leverage on the problem domain that you have. Um, and that's actually what like all software is about except recently. Um, so it's about small ambitious teams. It's about uh, taking a small team and letting us solve big problems. Um, but I, you've all heard a lot of this already, and what I wanted to do, and uh, I've, I ask for your indulgence, is I just want to show you a video of me building something awesome. Um, this is a different, uh, different. it's the same demo, but a different flavor than when I gave it yesterday, which was a room full of people who had never used Ember. Um, everyone in this room has already used Ember, so you'll understand what I'm doing, and I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about it as we go, but I'll also talk about it 
um, a little bit after. So uh, specifically what I'm going to be doing, let me just switch into, if I can get away with it, let me switch into mirroring mode. And I'm just switching into mirroring mode because it's easier to pause videos in Keynote if you're in mirroring mode. Um, so I'm just going to build a GitHub uh, issues reader. Um, I'm going to sit down. And I'm not typing this. This is recorded because it's impossible for me to do this demo uh, <coughs> live. Yeah, exactly. So basically, you will observe that that is not how fast NPM is. Um, so uh, yeah, so we go into GitHub issues, and the first thing we've already made the app, and that was like several minutes shorter than it would have been if I did it live. Anyway, we're booting the app, and the first thing that you do, as you probably know, is you go to localhost 4200. Okay, now we have Ember. Awesome. I actually like the fact that it show that we have a way of seeing what's slow. Um, this thing over here is just uh, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code for basically this entire demo, and you have to tell it that you're using ES6. So otherwise, it yells at you. It's like, what is export? I have no idea what's going on. So anyway, uh, so yeah, I log in. You can see that there is a thing that was generated. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to boot up the server again now that we have everything working and um, wait a little bit. Awesome. OK, now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, go into our app or index.html and take a look. So this is more for people who maybe haven't used Ember before, but there's like index.html, there's a styles page, and whatever. Now, what we would like to do is we would like to take the styles that our quote unquote designer have given us and paste it in. But you will see that when we paste it in, uh, everything's an error, so that's not so great. So we're going to rename this to SCSS. And this is actually the first place where, so awes awesomely, Visual Studio Code knows what's up, but that's not the point of this talk. Um, but we have to actually install SAS in Ember. So we're going to install it as an add on. It's um, Ember CLI SAS. Uh, we hit enter. Also, NPM would have taken longer. But I have fast forwarded it. Um, the joke will get old, don't worry. Yes, I know that's, that's what you would like it to look like. It's aspirational. Um, so now, after we installed Ember CLI SAS and we copied and pasted our designer's uh, CSS, we're going to uh, boot up the server again. And we're going to go in and, and run it. And now you'll see that, OK, awesome. Now we have slightly different welcome to Ember. <laughs> Getting off to a fast start here. Um, so okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to just paste in the header of our page, and you can see it's a header, and it has it's some links, and uh, we're using a thing called Font Awesome. How many of you have heard of Font Awesome here? Okay, awesome. So uh, Font Awesome. Okay, so we're using Font Awesome here, but of course we haven't installed it. So if we um, save this and go look at look at it in the browser, it's not going to look like anything. So what we need to do, uh, of course, is to uh, install the Font Awesome Ember CLI add-on. Um, by the way, I'll point out that I, when I started working on this talk, I didn't actually know how many add-ons I would be able to use, but it turns out that I'm able to use a lot of them, and that's great. It's for the demo, it works out great. But it was not a, I didn't optimize the demo for a lot of add-ons. Just every time I needed to do something, it happened to be that there was an add-on for it. Um, so we boot up Ember, the Ember server again after installing the add-on, and OK, great, now we have our we have our thing. But actually, the Font Awesome add-on comes with some components that we're going to use. Um, so we don't have to do that annoying repetition and the I. So we'll just fix that real quick. Um, and then if we reload the page after saving it, what we'll, see, uh, what we'll see is that everything still works. So nothing has changed, but that's a feature, not a bug in this case. Um, and you can see that uh, if we inspect. So I actually did this inspection just to make sure everything was working. And then I noticed that there was like an aria hidden there. And I was like, oh, I would totally not have remembered to do that at all if I did this manually. So good, good job, Ember CLI font, awesome. <coughs> OK, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to generate a route. And in the router, we're going to uh, take a look at it. And yeah, if you haven't used Ember before, yes, we generate some files for you. Seems good. Um, and, but what we need to do is we need to, uh, we need to actually go into the router. And I forgot to give it a path, so let's give it a path. And in this case, I'll call the, uh, I'll call the path segment username. That's just going to let us say params.username inside of the route. Um, so the first thing that we need to do now that we, um, now that we have this is we need to actually get some, some data from our designer, again, our hypothetical designer. Uh, and this is just like what we would like this to look like. So first of all, you can see that the CSS is working, which is fine. Seems good. Um, but this is effectively what we're going to be building. right? We're going to be building a list, and we'll do more eventually. Uh, th now, I'm not actually going to go into that much detail about what's happening in the route, but it's basically a, bunch, a model hook that does some stuff with the GitHub API. And then an after model hook, 
uh, which is probably, hello, hi, Ember people in the room, awesome. You guys know that this is not really exactly what you would probably do. You'd probably uh, use RSVP.all or something like that. But um, after model works okay if you have a couple of steps. <coughs> So what we're going to do now, now that we've added the after model, nothing has changed in the UI. But now that we actually have loaded the JSON, we can go take a look at what our data looks like. Um, so we don't have to like look at the documentation. We can just look at the data. It's actually loaded already, which is pretty nice. And what we'll do is now we'll make a couple of tweaks to the thing that our designer gave us um, just to get it to start looking real. right? So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to replace that uh, avatar URL with the real thing. And for anybody who predates, uh, who remembers bind adder, it's awesome that you can do that. Um, and when we reload, so everything looks the same because I'm still looking at Ycats, but let's go to like Rust. Actually, that's the wrong Rust. Let's go to the right Rust. Um, <laughs> and you can see that, okay, we have the right avatar. Great. So now we jump back, and what we want to do is we'll just do a little more, right? So uh, if we have a blog, then we use the font awesome icon, which we can still use. We can put the blog in the href. Okay, everything looks good. Unfortunately, Rust only has, uh, sorry. Uh, but we also want to do is we also want to include this other information, like your company and your location. Um, if they exist, we want to use them too. Uh, this is all sort of vanilla stuff. Um, unfortunately, Rust doesn't have those things, so we'll go back to Ycats. I do have those things, and we can see everything is, is working. So. Um, so far, so good. So the next thing we'll do is we'll fix another one of these uh, icons so that it ha uses the Font Awesome icon. And by the way, in a real company, like our designer could probably just use FA icon directly because it's pretty easy. Um, so uh, yeah, we put in the number of public repos. And what we'll start to see is, OK, it starts to look real. Now we have 181 repositories. We still have our book icon. Everything is looking good. However, now what we have is a giant list of the same thing over and over and over again. So let's not have a giant list of the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, thank you, designer, for doing all that great mock-up work. But we'll take it from here. Um, <laughs> so now if we have a single LI, and when we reload it, we'll see, OK, well, this is not so great because there's only a single LI. So of course, what we need to do is we need to make a loop. So uh, we'll do an each loop, each model.repos as pipe repo. Um, and close the each loop, and okay, now we have the same. We're gonna have the same li over and over and over again. So that's still probably better than before, but now it's repeated. So that's not exactly the thing that we wanted. So uh, great. So now we'll go in and we'll make some changes. So we'll change guides to you know repo dot name and uh, that thing there to be repo dot description. And one thing, um, as an Ember user, like everyone in the room kind of knows exactly what it is that I'm doing here, but there's actually a fair amount of stuff going on. Like if you weren't using Ember, we wouldn't be this far yet. Um, now what you'll notice is, OK, so some of these things have an empty description. So let's add a conditional here that says if repo.description, you know, we don't want to show the description if it doesn't exist. Um, so we'll just add a conditional there. Um, and another thing I would point out is that Ember has a strong philosophy of always ensuring that we that adding conditionals or control flow doesn't actually add more HTML. So we don't have to worry that our designer's CSS can get all messed up because maybe we, in order to do a conditional, we have to add a div. How do you even do that inside of an LI, unknown, right? Basically, we can just use normal if statements anywhere, and we know we don't have to worry about what DOM it produces. Um, and that's something that Ember has always cared about like since 0.x. We've always felt like it was very important. OK, so now you know we'll do a few more things. Um, change some of these icons, and uh, then we're going to want to change these numbers. So we reload. Uh, of course, the icons still work. But we also want to change the numbers so that they don't all say 415 forks, since Ember marked, which is a fork I made yesterday, has exactly zero things. So uh, the API is cute. It's stargazers count. One thing I noticed doing this is that the GitHub API is not very consistent. It's like kind of if someone thought they had a cute idea for a name, it goes in and Sometimes the word count appears, and sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, so now we, you can see that everything is, is good. Now we have the right number of stars. And we're actually making some quick progress here, right? We, we're starting to make some, some progress. OK, so now we have uh, updated. We want to say up repo that pushed that instead of hard coding it. And if we reload that, we'll see, OK, now it has the right thing, but it doesn't exactly read the way a human being would want to read it. By the way, uh, everybody knows this already, but we've been live reloading the whole time. We didn't, I didn't have to hit the refresh button at any point the entire time. OK, so now. Um, we're updating, but we're updating something uh, wrong. So let's get moment.js, because that's the way to do this correctly. So we'll install ember moment, uh, let npm heat up some fans somewhere. Um, and uh, note that because of the way that 
people make things on the internet today, that install installation command actually did a bunch of things um, that you didn't have to know about. We installed some things from Bower because that's where it happens to be stored and things that we all wish weren't real, but they are. Uh, okay, so now we can see updated some number of days ago. And yeah, so now we're going to, uh, so now that we've done that, let's make a new route. So we're going to make a new re a route for a repo. So we have, great, we have a list of all of YCATS' repos. What if we want to look at a repo? Um, so actually, I don't know if people knew this, but you can actually just add the path directly, which I didn't do before, but is better. Uh, and now if we go to the router, what we will discover, uh, let me reload that. What we will discover is that, okay, we have, get, we have a route, it's nested, it has the repo name, cool. So uh, now what we need to do is we need to actually get, uh, so actually the first thing we're going to do before we get the route is, now that we have a nested page, we need to actually take the stuff that was um, the index and we need to move it into the index page, right? And because now we have stuff that should show up on the index page and stuff that should show up on, well, when you go into an individual repo and those things are a little bit, those things are different, right? So now we can look at our repositories and we could also look at an individual uh, repository. Um, but now our repo uh, template doesn't actually do anything. So uh, let's just add some markups so that we can go look at it. So this is the original list. You can see it's still working because we moved everything to index. And now if we look at Ember Marked, okay, great. It has high in it. Um, I'm actually going fast here, but it, this is just how you uh, refactor into nested. And the TLDR is it just works. Um, okay, so now we make a route, and what the route is basically doing is it's uh, downloading some more data, right? So if we go look at the XHR, what we'll see is that um, we have now downloaded some more things. And again, I'm not talking about what the dollar get JSON is because hopefully everybody in the room knows how to use jQuery's Ajax. So uh, now we can look at it. Um, I, I went to handlebars.js because the first thing I looked at had no actual issues, and we want to look at what the issues actually look like. But it's kind of it's just GitHub API. Um, so next, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, copy in some stuff. Ah, no. I clicked on the wrong thing. OK. OK, so what? No, again? Why doesn't space do what I expect? OK, I'll just click this time. OK, so uh, what happens now is we're just copying some stuff. It, you know, it, you, we use the font awesome icon, but we also put in the login and the name. And we're going to check to make sure that that looks like what we expect, which it does, which is great. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to just enumerate. Uh, we're going to grab the, our, our designer's content, which is an LI, and that shows you a single thing. We can see the CSS is working, but it's all still hard coded. Um, and so again, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a loop. And again, it's pretty nice that we can just use loop syntax and not have to worry that much about what HTML thing we're looking at here. So we loop through model.issues, and we're allowed to just put an LI in there, and that works fine. <coughs> um, and then we say, OK, let's put the title in there and reload. OK, now we have a list of titles. Everything is working great. Um, now we're going to change that 10 into point at uh, issue.comments. Issue and we're going to uh, reload, and we're going to get a comment count, which is going to be good. So now you can see how many comments there are. Um, let me go look back again just to see what this looks like. And you can see that, okay, there's an embedded user, and the embedded user has a login. And so when we go to change Mixonic into the, sorry, Mixonic, you did not open every issue ever. Um, we're going to change it where you use uh, issue.user.login. Um, so we do issue.created at, and we um, change that to issue.user.login. And great, we reload the page, and awesome, now we have things. But we now yet we have the same problem bef as before, which is that the updated ad is just a big, giant weird string. So we use the same uh, helper that we got before, which is going to make it say 10 days ago, which is awesome. Seems good. So we're making some good progress here. Um, now that we actually have a real page, we can update the URLs instead of being a to-do href. And so we're going to say link to. Um, and we can just say we want to go to user repo. And we can give the repo dot, uh, repo dot name, which is the dynamic segment that is used there. and when we reload, we're going to find that every the link is going to work now. So let's go back, um, and we'll see. If we go to YCATS, we'll see that that link actually does what we expect. Great. So cool. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go into our repo, and we're going to change these other couple of links, because now our repos actually can point us back 
So we're going to go back to link to user. And note that in this case, uh, we can just say user because it, it remembers that we're nested inside of a user. We don't have to give it the original user. Um, so there's a lot of little nice things about how the router and the link system works in Ember. Um, so I'm going to you know, link to user at repo and close the link to. And if we reload the page, what we are going to find is that actually we have a build error. But actually, it's pretty cool that the build error appears in the browser. I actually didn't do that on purpose, but then I was like, that's pretty cool. So seems good, actually. So we'll fix the build error. We reload. And actually, live reload still worked, even though it was printing out a build error. And now we can start clicking around. So great. Now I'm looking at my RFCs. I can go back. Um, our links actually work. And you know every, everything is working. Now what you'll also notice, I can you know click. I can right click and say, open a new tab. I can reload all the things. I'm not going to spend any time on this, really, except for like a second, because you've all seen that talk years ago. But it is still a thing that always just automatically works in Ember, which is reminder that is a thing that automatically always works in Ember. <laughs> um, so OK, so we're going to make a new route. So now that we have our users and repos, we want to print a list of issues. So we're going to do the same story again. We're going to make a nested issue inside of our repo. And we're going to do the same refactoring, where we take the things that used to be there in, in the repo.hps as the index, and we're going to move them into index. And that way, we're going to be, al be allowed to switch from the index over into the actual individual stuff. right? So this is also pretty cool, the fact that you can pretty easily refactor things. Uh, model continues to work because it's automatically inherited and things like that. Okay, So now um, we have our list, and we're going to go in and make our actual issue. Uh, basically, same story, make, get some JSON, make it your model, seems great. Um, and now if we go look at uh, look at an example, we could again look at what the, what the JSON looks like. Um, so we go to 11.20. We haven't made the links yet, but we have the URL already. And if we go look at the JSON, we'll see, OK, we have some JSON, and it looks like what we would expect. Um, we didn't have to do much to make that work. Um, and I, it, one thing that's kind of useful to remember is that uh, even though you know, we have to write this JSON. The fact that it automatically happened when we entered certain URLs and something is actually automatically handling what happens when you enter various URLs is a pretty nice thing. OK, so we copied and pasted, again, some stuff from our designer. And now we're going to replace it with the real stuff. So model.title, and we're going to have uh, model.number. And we're going to replace that with the real user. And we're going to replace the time with the real time. Um, and just for good measure, I'm going to, again, remind us that we can use the moment.js thing. Probably at this point, I should have just done it. <laughs> but we can use it. We have it already loaded. So a moment from now, great. It's par basically part of our app vocabulary. We can use it whenever we want. So now, and one thing that's nice about that is that you know that every time you ever put in a date in your program, it's going to be consistent. OK, so now we put in the avatar. The avatar uses a link to. It can link back to the user. In this case, we actually have to give it which user we're linking to, but that's pretty easy. Um, we can put stuff inside of SRC. Uh, and then we put in a comment that says, the person commented 10 days ago. Um, I made a typo. Let me fix that. <laughs> um, but the problem now is that we are putting in the body, but GitHub is giving us the uh, body as markdown. And that was not markdown. But just to that wasn't so clear. So just to show you that it really, really is wrong, let's look at a case where there's markdown for real. And we can see that this is uh, actually, there's a bug, which is that I haven't implemented that link yet, which we'll fix in a second. Um, but if we go look at 1338, we'll see this is obviously wrong. Like there's missing uh, markup here. So before we fix that issue, let's go fix the missing link that we just found. So we'll go to the index. And you can see there's that to do there that was broken. So let's go fix that. Um, it's just a you know, simple matter of adding a link to here. And we can just do that. Uh, issue that, issue that repo dot issue number. And we can close it. I mostly didn't speed up any of my typing, so sometimes it's just normal speed of typing. So now if we go back, we'll see, OK, now we have the link. Seems good. So now we can click on it, and we'll get the link, but it's still the wrong thing. So what we would like to do is we would like to install Markdown. No problem. There is an, a Markdown add-on for Ember CLI, so let's do that. Um, I forked it just because to update it to Ember 2.0, which someone should do who actually maintains that. I should probably submit a PR. It actually was just removing before Observer, by the way, but with and replacing with Observer. It was a very weird thing. Uh, anyway, we're going to reboot the server. And now we can say, just say markdown section, model.body. And if we reload, 
we can we will see that it actually does the right thing seems good so we just added an add-on we used it does the right thing awesome now uh, the next thing that we will notice is that we still we only have the first comment but usually these comments have a whole comment thread we would like to have a whole comment thread so that's fine but it's gonna be a little bit of, there's something sticky here which is that it's not actually represented in github as a list it's represented as a, sing a, a single element and then a list so we could theoretically change the uh, structure of the, of the data, but instead what we'll do is we'll just extract out the whole comment thing as a component. So we'll make our first component here, which is the issue comment HBS, and we don't need JavaScript in this case. It's just a little chunk of markup that we move from one place to another. Um, so we copy it, and all we need to do now is we just need to change all these things that say model to say comment, um, and then that comment just becomes the attribute that we pass in. Um, so it's sort of like a little, a little, mark, a little HTML function. And now that we've done that, we can go back and we can uh, add, we can say issue comment, which is the name of the component we just created. We can say comment equals model. Um, and now just for good measure, we'll make sure that it still works. Um, we're removing the div because we get a div automatically with components. Okay, so it still works as expected. But now that we've done that, we can actually loop through all the, uh, all the comments in the comment thread. So we can say each model.comments as comment. And now we can reuse that same component again. And that was a pretty lightweight thing to do, right? We just copied some code, moved it somewhere else, uh, changed the, the markup to use the new parameter, and now we can just do that. Um, and now if we reload, everything still works. And what you'll notice is that it also, of course, still continues to use markup. However, there is colon ice cream. And we would like that to be real ice cream. No problem, Ember CLI add-ons has an emoji add-on. <laughs> so we'll do that. <laughs> Um, so I'll install the emoji on, <laughs> and uh, once it's done, we'll, go, we'll restart the server. And by the way, somebody who works on Ember CLI should watch uh, when you run any Ember command that installs things that should restart the server. You shouldn't have to do that. Okay. Uh, anyway, that was a troll because I should probably do it myself. Uh, Anyway, so we add emoji tag and we reload, and what we'll see is that the ice cream thing exists. So that's basically that's walking through. So now we so now we have to get back to the title of my talk, which is production application. So now we built an application. It works. It's awesome. We would like to actually deploy it to production. So actually, it turns out we have already done all the work in Ember. So uh, even though we use a bunch of add-ons, all we have to do is run Ember build dash dash n production. We hit enter. It'll take some time build some things. And now if we look at what's in dist, we'll actually see it has minified things. But because Font Awesome is an add-on and add-ons know about production, it also knew how to copy the Font Awesome stuff in there. Right? And if we look at vendor, the vendor, we can see that we got minified. That does the right thing. But you can also see that it knew how to put the right CSS Font Awesome stuff. Right? And that was, that's something you didn't have to do at all. You use an add-on. It knows, it knows that you're probably building a production app. And so it did it for you automatically. Now the next thing I'm going to do is uh, just deploy it to Surge, just to show you that it actually is a thing that works in production. And Surge is basically DivShot, except DivShot doesn't exist anymore. Surge does. So yay, they're now in my talk. Turns out you have to exist. Uh, OK, so anyway, now we're going back. And uh, we go to the thing, and you can see that it basically works. We can click around. It is the same application we just built, except it's production. It's minified. It has all our assets, et cetera. So uh, that's pretty cool. And you can see it has the markdown. Everything works the same way we, we did it before. Just clicking around to really prove it. <coughs> um, so what's kind of cool about all that is that Ember is an integrated, plat an integrated uh, tool that lets you actually build applications pretty fast. Again, that wasn't really a contrived demo. That was, it was definitely a demo, right? But it was not a contrived demo. Um, I think I did a, a line count. It's like a little over 100 lines of JavaScript in total, almost all of which are in the routes. And it, it just actually is a tool that takes, does all the things that you would need to do to build a real application and puts them in one place so you don't have to think about them. And more importantly than you not having to think about them, well, first of all, I don't have to think about them when I'm building Skylight, which is pretty awesome because I'm pretty busy when I'm working on Skylight on doing design. Um, ah. So, uh, but, but better than you not having to worry about them personally, we get to all solve the problems together. And that is, that is a thing that is pretty powerful and pretty important and something that I think we can all be proud of. I'm actually going to switch back into, into presenter mode. Okay, so um, 
Ember is Ember is an integrated solution. It's it solves all the things that are pretty common in software. And I think uh, Ember is proud of it. And I think everyone in this room can be proud of helping to make something that we can all uh, that we can all use together to build things that are pretty awesome. Um, it's also for a particular kind of app, and I think this is a little this can be confusing. So I want to help you tell your friends what kind of app Ember is for. Um, what it is for is a kind of app that the code for the app runs in the client. It's like an Android or iOS app in the sense that the code for the app runs in the client, and it gets its data from the server. The way you can understand whether an app is appropriate for Ember or not is you need to answer the question of what happens when I click on a link. If the answer to what happens when I click on a link is that you go back to the server and the server gives you more HTML, then that is not an Ember app, and it is not an appropriate use case for an Ember app. Um, there, are, there is a totally viable kind of app, which is basically your JavaScript code is a parasite on top of HTML provided by the server. That kind of app is actually the dominant kind of app in the world today and probably will be forever. That kind of app is totally great, and there are a lot of libraries that are designed to help you build that kind of app. Ember is not one of those libraries, and you should not, uh, try, you should not try to use Ember for that. Um, and, you should, uh, and you should also, when you're, compa you're trying to understand what you should use, you should try to look at other applications that are built this way, right? So if you say, oh, I would like to see what framework I want to use, you should not look at an application that is built as a parasite on top of an HTML page to figure out whether that is a good example for your application. Um, cool. So uh, I'll, just uh, I'll just close by talking a little bit about um, some stuff you're going to see today and what I'm personally very happy about. Um, we saw a lot of Ember add-ons existing in the world, but of course it is important to be able to find and rate them and understand whether they're good. Um, Emberaddons.com and Emberobserver.com, I didn't show my demo, but these are the ways that you discover whether an application, whether an add-on exists and whether it's going to be reasonable. Um, Katie will talk a lot more about that later. Um, I, uh, I talked a little bit about some companies before uh, that use Ember. Uh, there's some great talks later by uh, talking about Intercom's experience with Ember and one, another one talking about Ghost's experience with Ember, um, built with .ember, uh, built with .io, or built with Ember.io, whatever. Uh, has a cool Tomster on it. And um, you can check it out. There's actually a lot of good examples. Pretty much every time I give a talk and I want to find things to feature, I look there to see if there's anything I've forgotten. So uh, if you're interested in some examples of awesome Ember apps that you can use to show your friends and uh, feel happy, definitely check it out. Um, I also really like the Ember release cycle. So earlier on, I talked about the fact that we're kind of stuck in a, a bubble of cynicism and pes pessimism. and the Ember release cycle and the six-week release cycle in general is kind of a reaction to the cynical idea that we have to reboot the universe every year just to keep up. Um, I think incremental improvement is the sleeper idea of modern software development, and I think if you look at the web, that's pretty much proof of that. If you look, the past 10 years are, uh, are pretty amazing. If you compare like the web 10 years ago to the web today, it's, it's really different. And the past 10 years of software development make me incredibly optimistic about the next 10 years, but the way we're going to do it is by making things a little bit better a little bit at a time. Not going to talk about any of these things because uh, I have no time, but uh, we're going to keep making things better in 2016. So I'm working right now on Glimmer 2. Uh, you can see me talking about that on the web in other places. Uh, we're going to keep making Fastboot better. So Fastboot already exists, but we're going to do rehydration. Um, engines are a reaction to the fact that as projects get bigger and bigger and bigger, you end up with multiple teams working on one app, and you would like to have a, a consistent way of doing that in a way that's pretty nice. Um, that's also coming in 2016. Uh, you should ch definitely check out Matthew's talk about uh, HTML bars for more about sort of the internals of how these things work. Um, I want to close with a quote from um, Steve Jobs in 1997 as he was just returning to Apple. So this is, uh, he's talking to the WWDC audience in 1997. Uh, it's actually a hostile crowd because he actually just destroyed a bunch of stuff that they were working on inside of Apple because it was all too many things happening. Um, but he, he's uh, talking about why Next Step and Coco is good. Because it's all about managing complexity, right? You're developers, you know that. It's all about managing complexity. It's like scaffolding, right? You erect some scaffolding, and if you keep going up and up and up, eventually the scaffolding collapses of its own weight, right? That's what building software is. It's how much scaffolding can you erect before the whole thing collapses of its own weight. Doesn't matter how many people you have working on it. Doesn't matter if you're Microsoft with three, four hundred people, five hundred people on the team, it will collapse under its own weight. You've read the Mythical Man Month, right? Basic premise of this is 
A software development project gets to a certain size where if you add one more person, the amount of energy to communicate with that person is actually greater than their net contribution to the project, so it slows down. So you have local maximum, and then it comes down. We all know that about software. It's about managing complexity. These tools allow you to not have to worry about 90% of the stuff you've worried about so that you can erect your five stories of scaffolding but starting at story number 23 instead of starting at story number six. You can get a lot higher. And with that, I will say, take the power of Ember and build amazing things. Build higher. Thank you very much.